Hey, everybody. So we are here today to do another installment of our Q&A. Uh, we got a really great response last time we did questions and answers. And so we have gotten more of your questions um, and we have more answers. So we have a few that we can start. And then um, we also uh, will, of course, be monitoring the chat. So I do know that Nick and Kelsey, um, part of our marketing team, will be monitoring the chat today. So thank you, Nick and Kelsey, for helping us with that. So folks, post your questions in the chat. Um, we are, are we on YouTube and Facebook live? Yes, we are on both today. Lord have mercy. We are in two places at once, once again. I don't know how all this happens. It's, it's Dawn's magic. So um, side note real quick, all of you that see everything that, that is on our Facebook page, YouTube channel, Instagram page, it is Dawn and her team, Nick and Kelsey, that make all of this stuff happen. So if you want to write some nice things in the chat to them, I know they would appreciate that. They'd never admit to such things, but it truly is wonderful what they do. And um, thank you guys for engaging in the things that they do. Also, or just a real brief, quick, um, uh, just want to extend gratitude to all of our Facebook followers, Instagram followers, people on YouTube, like what's been going on through this, this, um, this whole pandemic, in case you're watching this at a later time, um, the resilience and um, how resolute our prospects and customers are has been a really, really motivating thing um, for our team, our family here at Tilson and, and the whole Tilson team. Would you say, Dawn? Absolutely, it, you? yes. It's It's been great to see everybody and, and all the comments and feedback and just how much everybody's still still going with the process and just excited about building a home and, and just moving forward. So we really appreciate all of you. Yeah, and we're real grateful to be a part of, of uh, what little positivity is left on the internet. <laughs> yes. we're, and, we're, and we're grateful to engage with you guys uh, in that way. So thank you so much for uh, supporting us, supporting our family, our, our little family business and the folks that we employ and the contractors that we employ. Um, we are so grateful for that and that's not lost on us. So. Thank you. You have our gratitude. Um, that being said, let us get into our Q and A, Don. We've got some questions and answers to get to. So here we go. Where are here we, we starting? Um, so the first one that people are asking us about is what is our process? That is a great place to start. <laughs> what is the process? Uh, so it is, it is fairly simple. It is different from production, of course. Um, most production subdivision builders, you know, you're kind of shopping by where it is with the proximity to the school you want your kids to be in, proximity to your job, maybe something like that. And while those might come into play uh, on the on your lot spot, uh, side, really it's more about um, what we're finding from our prospects and customers. It's about the plan uh, and where, most importantly. So uh, obviously our process is revolves around where it's being built and the plan that the family wants. So. First and foremost, you're going to see, we want you to select the home plan and make customizations to it. And of course, you're not limited necessarily uh, like you would be in a production subdivision. Um, we do have our own plans. They all have uh, some degree of custom options to them, but you're limited by, as we've said before, you know, your budget, the laws of physics and the building code. Um, and, and the third one, luckily, is kind of into interpretation at times. So the first <laughs> two are pretty, pretty finite, but the third one is open to interpretation. Um, but anyway, select and customize uh, whatever plan. We're going to get that all priced out for you, of course. We we do all the pricing up front using our desktop pricing. So we sign an agreement based on that upfront contract price, which we think is really important, offers the customer uh, a great amount of security. And then um, we're going to set up a color appointment. Now, typically, I know that could sound very daunting, but a lot of those things were at least talked about prior to, right? So like you know, maybe you looked at a couple of the wood floor samples or cabinet paint color samples, things like that, just to arrive at that upfront contract price. So it's not like a full on, just you've never seen these things before. Um, you're gonna have some idea of those, but choosing those design finishes. Uh, also during that time, we're gonna be meeting you out of the property, uh, doing what we refer to as a stakeout, which we've said it's not the, not the donut eating, binocular looking police stakeout. It's, it's we meet you on the property and actually stake the corners um, of the home. Uh, do some evaluation things like, hey, how, where's the water going to come from? How's the power getting here? How far off the road are we? Um, what kind of clearing still needs to be done? It also gives us a chance to initiate. We put our sign out there, and um, that may or may not be the ultimate sign we're going to be using, but it gives the soil testing company a, a point of reference. You know, A lot of places we build are completely uninhabited. They've not been touched by human hands. So uh, they don't show up on a lot of maps sometimes. So we put that little sign out there so that when the soil testing truck's driving around the middle of nowhere, Texas, they, they go. Know where to go. They know they're in the right spot. Yeah. 
And that's an exciting meeting because that's where you're really kind of planning out exactly where the house is going to go on your lot and, you know, planning all of those those details out and you'll leave with a to-do list and we'll leave with a to-do list and then we'll Yeah, that's a, back great, in. a very great point. I'm glad you pointed that out because it is because it's built on your land, uh, you are an integral part of the process, not just from the point, because obviously that's that's the case, but from the hey, you, we know you had a vision of what you wanted to see when you bought this property long before you ever brought Tilson into the picture. You know, we we kind of sometimes feel like the third wheel of the date. You're in love with this property and you kind of invited us out here to eat dinner. We're like, okay, well, where do we stand? But, but <laughs> truly, we want to fulfill your vision on this land. And so we're going to tell you kind of what you'll be looking at. Hey, here's the covered porch. Here's what you're going to be looking at. Here's your master bedroom. Is this what you anticipated on seeing out the window? Um, that's what happens at that appointment. So it is really exciting. That's great, great feedback. Yeah. What else? What else do we do? Oh, we finalize the plans. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, notice, notice, notice all this is happening prior to construction. So we really want, you're going to sign off on a full set of plans. You're going to sign off on uh, what we call our options addendum, which is kind of like your, your full color selections and the building specifications of the home. All that signed off on by all parties so that everybody is completely crystal clear on what we're going to go build. Um, we're going to pull whatever necessary permits are, are uh, applicable. And that might be just a county building permit, maybe a city building permit. It may be a uh, approval from an, a homeowners association or an architectural control committee. Um, so that all that will be done and taken care of. And then, of course, we're going to build the home uh, yeah. based on your specifications. And we have a pre-construction meeting that kind of kicks that off where the your sales consultant and your building superintendent and your project manager and you, the customer, all meet out at the property at the same time. And you know, kind of go over one last time. Here's here's where we're seeing the utilities coming from. Here's where the power's coming in. Here's where the septic stubbed out. Here's where the driveway's going to be. So, um, anyway, that's a cool, cool meeting because um, it really starts to be quite yeah. weird. Um, then with the whole construction process is in between that six and seven, and then uh, we get the house all finished up, and you're going to have a homeowner orientation or kind of a walkthrough that's scheduled where we show you how to do all the cool stuff. How do you program the thermostats? How do you change the air filters out? You know, how do you um, service the P traps underneath the sink and, and all the different kinds, how do you turn the appliances on? And um, we don't have to tell people how to program VHSs and change the clock on them. That's we're not doing that. We don't do VHS <laughs> tape recorders anymore. You got to figure the clock out yourself. Um, and then you, you live your dream and enjoy, and you tell your friends, we didn't put referrals in here, but we didn't, we keep forgetting to tell our friends about that. No, we're not good at bragging. We don't get, we don't brag about ourselves. So, but yes, you have a, a warranty of course. So Tilson's not gone. Whenever you move into the house, we're not going anywhere. Um, you, if you have issues, we have our own warranty department. You call warranty and a Tilson employee answers the Tilson phone. And then we send mm -hmm. a Tilson employee and a Tilson vehicle to fix your Tilson home. So, um, it's not some third party contractor you've never met or heard of. With the exception of the big, like, we're not going to send a Tilson warranty technician out to fix your HVAC system, right? If your HVAC right. is not performing, we're calling the HVAC company because that's a real thing in Texas. Like, that needs to get fixed. So, Absolutely. anyway, that's the process. If you got any questions more about that, we'd love to help you out. Um, and, Don, we have questions in the chat right now you want to get to? You want to go with our other prompts that we've done? Uh, we've got a couple comments. Um, Janice is letting us know that that her home building is in process and out on property, about eighty percent done, and very happy. So thank you, Janice, for sharing thank that you and so for, yeah, thank you for trusting, trusting us with your home. Um, that's great. And then I think I saw one pop up that didn't come into my feed. Um, they are asking about timing. Ah, okay. Yes. So we're in the middle of COVID. We don't yeah. actually. You know, we say in the middle. I don't know where we are. We're somewhere. <laughs> you don't know where the until you know where the end is. But um, we're today in COVID. We are today in COVID. We are on day 136 of spring break, 2020. Um, Worst spring break ever. Yes. So uh, traditionally, we had, it's 10 to 12 months. Okay. We have some that get done before that. Um, we have some that take a little longer. Not very many, but some. Um, but that's what we have historically t told people over the last couple of years. Um, that's total time. So that's time from the, you give us the deposit. So that includes all that process I just went through. That's not just construction. Right. Construction is only really about six to eight months of that. Um, the, a lot of that, not uh, quite half of it, but almost half of it is the upfront design and permitting and engineering and color selections and loan approval and all that kind of good stuff. And then, um, construction. So what we're telling people right now is 12 to 14 months. 
we're not seeing that yet, okay? But but we're kind of forecasting that a little bit. There's some dis- there's certainly disruptions among county offices, local municipalities, um, cities and counties, and and even ACCs are still trying to kind of figure out how to deal with when they get a positive case. For instance, some are shutting down completely. So if a county office shuts down without warning, well, that'll affect us being able to get title work done. That'll affect us being able to get building permits, septic permits, culvert designs, uh, approvals. So we're factoring that in, you know, we don't, uh, if, if uh, the window company gets uh, a COVID infection or two or 10 at their facility, you know, how these businesses decide to deal with, with when they have a positive um, case come back is truly up to them. You know, they're CDC guidelines, but they are in fact guidelines. There's no law right. or playbook or anything out there telling you what to do. So some of them shut down for a week. Some of them send everybody home until you test negative. You can come back. Some of them will shut the whole thing down for two weeks, which actually could push del- production back four to six weeks. So we're telling people that because we are anticipating some disruptions. We already know for sure there are going to be disruptions in the in the global supply chain. Um, some of the things that we source, I was on the phone with one of our largest suppliers earlier in the week and um, actually in the last week, and a lot of the materials for like the interior doors, let's just say, some of the material is sourced in South America, um, some of it Brazil, some of it Argentina, and you know they're dealing with the same thing that we're all dealing with. Um, mm-hmm. We only hear about the U.S. cases mostly, but everybody else has their own country that they're dealing with, and they have different ways that they shut their facilities down. So anyway, all that to say that um, we anticipate certainly some disruptions. The beautiful part about all that is Tilson's not going anywhere. We're building the house out of our own back pocket. So there's no, the, there's no construction loan that's flapping out there that you're paying interest on while this right. is taking a long time. This is Tilson's money on the ground and we can afford to have that on the ground and not get paid till the house is finished, uh, which really, really sets us apart. So it's not something that you, it's inconvenient, but it's not something that needs to stress you out. Don't let right. it stress you out. And we'd certainly do it sooner if we can. And and if we're able to, we'll do it sooner. We just want to be really upfront and honest with everyone. So you know what to expect, that we are expecting delays. So you should expect it to take a little bit longer. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Okay. Um, Rebecca is asking, when it comes to high-tech upgrades, do we offer things like Wi-Fi repeaters, automated blinds, and smart home add-ons? Or are those things that the homeowner would need to do after closing? So we highly recommend that you do those things after closing. Couple of reasons. Um, number one, uh, let's talk about the Wi-Fi repeaters. Oftentimes, we don't. We certainly don't know who the internet service provider is going to be that you're going to choose. Ninety-one uh, percent of what we build is rural, so we have a lot of folks that end up using satellite for broadband. Um, not everyone. So you, it actually surprises me sometimes where there's fiber available in the middle of nowhere. Um, and on the flip side of that, it surprised me that there's no high speed data in a place that I feel like there should be. So with that level of unpredictability in Texas, um, I wouldn't plan, I wouldn't design my home around it. I certainly wouldn't spend money during the construction process until I know for a fact who's going to be providing the Wi-Fi, what kind of bandwidth I really get from that. So maybe work with it for a week or two before you decide, um, where all your mesh needs to be for the Wi-Fi. And then, yeah, certainly on the automated blinds, I would hold off on that until you start moving your furnishings into the home. Like what color couch do you have? What color, you know, uh, trying to plan all of those things around what color curtains, drapes, throw pillows, all that stuff you're going to have can be very, very overwhelming, I would think. I'm, I, I mean, to me, a pillow is a pillow, but I have found that there are certain pillows you're allowed to lay on and there are pillows that you are not allowed to lay on. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't know that. It's a thing. And, Yes, we had in the house I grew up in, my mom had some recovered and they were, we nicknamed them the sacred pillows because <laughs> turns out you can't lay on those when nope. you're three boys living at home. But not a thing. You come in from playing football outside, you can't just lay on any pillow you want to. Ooh. Oh, no, especially not when you're gross. Come on, Eric. It's news to me. So, uh, all that to say, Rebecca, I, I, I would, Don, what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I would wait just to make sure that, that you're in there and you've got it situated properly before you start spending a lot of money um, on that stuff. And also I'd hate to see it get damaged during some other part of the process. Um, it's it's not inexpensive to do automated blinds and things like that. So it'd be better served to have everything else completed, done, inspected um, before you start installing those things. It's a great point. Yeah. I forgot we break stuff. It's possible. We try not to, but you know, it, it does happen. Yeah. 
just like when you lay on the decorative pillows that you're not supposed to. Yeah, like, exactly. It happens. Um, Ephraim is asking um, in kind of that process that we were showing, when are we actually walking the actual plan to build site? So when is that stakeout happening? Great question, Ephraim. We actually, we try to do that as soon as we have the, some type of survey or a really good uh, plat of the lot from the customer. So the customer brings us a survey of their property, usually right at the beginning of the process or, or right after we initiate the uh, the agreement and we go out there and take a look at the property right then and there, pretty early on. Like it's one of the first things that happens, that usually within weeks of you initiating the agreement, we come out and take a look at the, at the build site. Um, it's not really necessary before that because I mean, unless you know of something that's just going to prevent it from happening, um, if you're on, if you have public right of way of, or even any kind of legal ingress and egress, that's the only thing that would really stop you from being able to build. Um, nothing about the site's going to change from when you, like the topography of the site or what's underneath the soil, none of that's going to change from when before you sign your agreement to afterwards. Um, so that's why we do that right as soon as the customer initiates an agreement with us and we go out to the site, shoot the grades. And then based on that, that's when we order the soil test. Their soil test really tells us everything. Uh, and the kicker is we can't really order that until we know exactly what house you're building and exactly what changes you made to the house. Cause we go and we stake that out. We want to be sure that those soil tests are taken from within the footprint of the home. Right. It's really, really important to us. A lot of builders won't, they'll take it from the bar ditch. They'll take it from, you know, kind of anywhere on the lot, but Man, we I really want it taken from inside the footprint of the home, exactly where that foundation is going to sit. That's a big deal to us. Absolutely. Great. Um, Krista is asking us to review the referral process. Can we review it? Yeah. So you, uh, if you were a Tilson customer that refers a customer to Tilson Homes, we end up selling them a home. As soon as that house starts construction, you get five hundred dollars. And let Oprah Winfrey here. You get five hundred dollars. <laughs> The customer that bought the house from us gets five hundred dollars towards upgrades. So yeah, it's five hundred bucks for each person in the in the in the deal. So your friend that you refer gets five hundred bucks in upgrades towards their home, and you get five hundred dollars once we start construction on their house. And Eric and Don's undying affection and gratefulness. Absolutely. Which just, is, I, I that. it's priceless. Priceless. Just that. make sure when your friend goes in that they do mention mention you, and you also um, at closing should have been given some gift certificate looking cards um, to give to your friend that you can write your name on that they can present uh, when they arrive, and that has all the information about their free upgrades, um, their five hundred dollars worth of upgrades. That if you don't have any of those, Krista, private message us, and we will get yes, them. Yes, we will make sure you get some. Okay. Um, let's see. Edgar has a question. Um, he's a first time homeowner. Um, interesting, interested in having a home built. Do we still get the incentives of first time home homeowners? All right, Edgar, uh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. I would be, you got to be very careful when looking at marketing material. Don, close your ears. I'm kidding. No, no the, uh, there really aren't any such thing as first time home buyer incentives. I know that's How hard. So, to, Eric. Uh, um, so mortgage companies, there are there are laws in place that prevent them from showing favoritism to any type of group. So, yeah, that the, if they offer a loan program to some, with the exception of VA, that is truly an entitlement because our veterans are entitled to that. That is an entitlement. Um, all other programs, your FHA, your conventional. Um, they're, they they have to offer the, now. There's some income limitations on like your USDA loans, and there's some maximums on that. But there, as far as buying a home for the first time or buying a home for the twelfth time, the loan qualifications don't work differently. Um, and so there aren't there are not different types of incentives. And that's a, and I I don't like the way that lenders and in some cases builders use that first time home buyer. Uh, that is a there's a marketing ploy that that is um, deceptive is a strong word, but it's not it's it's misleading at the very least, um, because th the truth is they're going to offer the same type of deal to everybody who comes in. And that should be the best deal they can possibly offer, which is what we do. Um, so it, it's whether it's uh, whether you're building a home or buying existing you need to get the best deal you can get. And that should go for your interest rate. That should go for whatever. Now, what you'll see is production subdivision builders that have an inventory on the ground, which is very few right now. Mm -hmm. um, they might be offering some incentives 
to get you to come buy that particular home. I would be very leery of that right now because builders from coast to coast are going gangbusters. Every builder I know of is at full throttle, tons of sales, no inventory. People are wanting to move. They want out of the cities. They want out of their apartment. They want out of the existing living situation. And there are no, I don't know of any, like of the traditional incentives to try and move a slow moving community. Is that, is that yeah. Makes sense? yeah, I think that makes sense. Basically, if you're, if you're seeing a deal, wonder why. Yeah, I would be really skeptical right now, Edgar, man. I'd um, ask a lot of questions, brother, because mm-hmm. um, I really think, I really think you that I wish they wouldn't use that phrase, quite frankly. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Amber is letting us know she just finished her stake out last week. Um, it was really a great experience to see where the house was going. And she already sent somebody to us. So hopefully she they gave him your name and five hundred dollars. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks, Amber. We appreciate that. Excited Thank you. For you. Um, let's go into our next prepared question because I think there's a lot of a lot of really? related questions. It's, it's very common. Um, how much can I change your floor plans? Very, very common question. Uh, Super common question. Yeah. Dawn, you um, want to take a first wag at this? Sure. Um, so really the plan changes that you can make are, are limited by the, the three factors that we listed before, the laws of physics, building code, and your budget. Um, I will say in most cases, the budget is the biggest limiting factor. So if you have a really long wish list, uh, make sure you've prioritized that into your must haves versus your nice to have. So we can kind of meet in the middle, um, but we can make whatever changes um, you're looking for. So we can move room, move walls, we can add rooms, we can put a porch on it. We can have a two car garage, a three car garage. That garage can be attached, it can be detached. Um, you can change the exterior materials. I mean, really everything. Um, is kind of up up for debate, up, up for changing. Um, we do have some interactive floor plans on our website. Um, really, those are just intended to give you an idea of the most common things that we change and give you kind of a starting point um, for brainstorming. It's, it's the most common request that we get. Um, and they're pre-designed because it just makes it easier for our team to price that out for you and for you to visualize where that's going to work best. Um, on the floor plan, but really we can go far beyond that. Um, we do you know, have a few recommendations, which is if you're looking to, if you really fell in love with a house, but it's outside of your budget or it's a little bit too big, um, start with a smaller one. It's just way more cost effective for us to add features to a smaller home than it is to try to make a big home smaller. Um, Cause once you start taking, taking space out, you start affecting how the outside of the home looks. So what yeah. you may have been really in love with no longer looks the same. Um, so we always have to make it smaller. Because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. So just because yes. you can make changes to a plan does not necessarily mean you should make those changes to a plan. Um, and it's, I guess with all of life change for the sake of change is not necessarily a good thing. Change should benefit. Um, right. Um, I would, I would be leery of just throwing changes at a plan. You know, sometimes we find if you st- start changing a plan too much, it's probably the wrong plan. Right. Right. So, so be open-minded is what I'd say when you're visiting with your uh, design consultant, with your sales consultant, um, listen to, to the kind of the guidance that they're giving you and don't be too, um, dogmatic about a certain plan because you like the way it looks on like say the outside, um, be real specific with us on on when you say, I love this plan. And we say, well, what is it about the plan that you like? Be like, you're not going to hurt our feelings. Be, be vulnerable with us. Say, well, I like the way the outside looks. The inside is really terrible. Mm-hmm. Cool. Let's go a different plan. I can make the outside of this one look like whatever you want and, and go from there. So. Yeah, the outside is probably the easiest. So if you know you like this floor plan, but you like that exterior, be, be upfront with us because it's a lot easier to make the outside of a plan look like look like what you want. Definitely. And that a related question that we we also get a lot is, can I bring in my own floor plan or a floor plan from another company? All right. Great question. Uh, let's deal with the other company first. So floor plans are copyrighted, um, just, like, just like other things. Um, so it, we cannot build a home exactly like a plan of someone else that you bring to us. That's We're not going to do that. Um, it's unethical primarily. It's also illegal. Um, and yes, one supersedes the other to us. So the, um, the other thing about this, but 
I mean, if you find a plan on the internet, something like that, you want you're interested in that plan, or you have a set, you've had a set of plans drawn for you, bring them to us. Okay, but here's I would I would offer the same advice I offered even one of ours. Be very clear about what you like and don't like about that plan, and be open minded. You know, if you find a plan online or on Pinterest or SouthernLiving.com or one of the houseplans.com, um, then understand that that there's there may be some features about it. And actually, we Don's working on a, a blog post about this about where it might have been designed for. You know, I mean, you mm-hmm. got these companies that are based out of who knows where: Wisconsin, Vermont, Wyoming, Texas. Um, that are designing homes to a nationwide audience and and um, they build homes differently in northeastern Maine than we build it in Matagorda County, Texas. So um, the designs don't always transfer fluently. The other thing I would say is there may be some things about it that make that home very, very, very expensive. You know, if it's got wraparound porches, you know, if it's got 1,800 square feet of porch and and 27 foot ceilings and, a, you know, big timber truss on the front and back of it that goes all the way through, like you'd see at a lodge in Colorado, like, yeah, man, that's all cool stuff. And that would look awesome. But at what cost? You right. know, so, so just be open minded to, you know, and don't be surprised if, if, a, if your Tilton sales consultant brings out one of our plans that's fairly equivalent, like say maybe in square footage of living area, and just uses that as a starting point and says, okay, well here, you know, you the home you brought me is 2,500 square feet of living area. Our San Jacinto is about 2,500 square feet of living area. So let me take the, the covered porch differences, the garage square footage differences, um, the living area differences and, and start with that and see, you know, how important is the, are the features of this plan to you? And can I maybe take one of ours, modify it some, make it incorporate the features that you really like about your plan for a cost of, for the budget that you're giving us. Um, Cause there's, there's probably a reason why it's the number one selected plan on whatever houseplans.com. It's, it's, it's usually got some really unique features um, that are going <laughs> to got the price like tag to match equally unique. So yeah, bring it to us for sure. But um, you know, I, I will say I, I used to do this for a living. I used to design houses with people like, on the weekends and did that for a decade with us. And I will say it was very, very, very rare that the, the plan that the customer brought in from the internet or from their friend who's an architect or whatever was the plan we ended up ultimately building for them. Um, we usually, it was a combination of that and one of ours and, and that's what we've moved on down the road with. Great, great explanation. Um, Janice just had a comment that, you know, she was very happy that we allowed her to customize and adjust her plans, you know, changing ceilings, walls, outdoor plugs, um, just super happy. So thank you, Janice. Thank you so um, much. Yeah. For sharing that. Um, Michael wanted to share his experience with Eric and Katie, um, for just being so patient and helpful, answering all of his questions. And thank you, Michael, for attending our presentations. We're glad that you're, you're finding it useful and he's going with the Magnolia. So all right, Michael, really thanks, cool. for thanks for the kind words. Thank you. And uh, let's see, Megan is looking at the Angelina A house plan with the side garage that sticks out towards the front. Um, can we show an example because she's not sure if it'll stick out too far and look strange. So if you go into the design center, um, they should be able to show you as they, they have the tools there that change not just the floor plans themselves, but actually change what the exterior looks like. Um, so your design consultant should be able to kind of show you what the outside of the home is going to look like when you add that garage. Yeah, it's um, I, honestly, it it's hard to show on a one dimensional, um, but it's not, it's not too, too, it really doesn't stick out that far, quite frankly. Um, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Um, Did you want to share your screen? I'm trying to, th- is it one that we can do on the website? In fact, actually, if you want to go to it at, um, well, the somewhere. website doesn't show the outside. And I think that's what she's worried about. Oh, well, then, uh, let me go down. Yeah. Let me, but I know the work copy does. Sorry guys. We're speaking in code. Yeah. Um, beg our pardon. <laughs> it's not Don's fault. It's Eric's fault. Um, so yeah, I can do that. So this is roughly, um, what it will look like. Let me find it where to go. I'm, 
do this in a second. Share that. All right. Is this what you're looking at, Don? I think so. There it is. So this would be the uh, Angelina with a front load garage. And this is what it's going to look like from the right side. So this is the garage coming out here. Hide us so it'll get bigger. Yeah, this is the front of the home here. So here's your front door. Here's the um, overhead door. And of course, that you can, you know, still do it from the side if you wanted to. This happens to have it as a front load. Um, and then this is the left side uh, of the home. So this is the garage portion here. Obviously, the rear of the home doesn't change at all. Um, but the front, I mean, it looks like a looks like a good looking regular house. Yeah. Um, one that I would not be putting Christmas lights on with a twelve twelve roof pitch. So. Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's hit the wrong button. Sorry. Okay. All right. Hopefully that helped, but uh, yeah, it's. I mean, it was designed that way from the get go. Um, we don't feel like it sticks out too far, but uh, of course, that's, I mean, that's a matter of opinion. But. Yeah. Let's see. Brett is asking um, with his garage door opener, doorbell, smart thermostat, can he purchase his own and have us install them in place of our equipment? So, we're, Brett, we're not going to install it. Uh, we're going to be installing our own uh, equipment for sure on the thermostat because it's part of the Linux, Linux package. Um, they, it is a programmable thermostat, Wi Fi enabled, all that kind of good stuff. We have to install it for, for the uh, energy raters inspection. If you want to change it out to the fact, you can do that. Um, I'd just be very careful about it. The um, and then yeah the the doorbell I'm I, I'm guessing you maybe you want like a ring doorbell or something like that that's um, again you're 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 typically the house is not ready to go or not not all Wi-Fi turned on whenever you, at that mm -hmm. point anyway so that's not that's just not going to work because uh, that's typically going to happen until you close on the home it funds and then you move in then you can have all your accounts turned on um, so that wouldn't be so we're going to have the regular doorbell on there and then um, the openers we use are actually pretty advanced uh, garage door openers. So um, now if there's a specific one you're wanting, like let us know and we, you know, there's a very good chance we can get with our vendor and find out. And and if that's different on the, the doorbell and thermostat, definitely ask, like we can check with our vendors and, and get just about anything you can think of. Um, but it, there aren't things that, you know, you can go buy from like Amazon or Home Depot or something like that and have us install. Uh, our installers are typically not going to put something in that they didn't source. Um, and not because of a big old money making operation, it becomes a whose fault is it if it doesn't work? You know, and trying right. to work warranty behind that. I mean, we're gonna stand yeah. behind it and who's and responsible if it's missing parts. Um, yeah. you know, it's much, much easier for us to deal with our own um vendors yeah, we, and not, we can not hold their feet to, to the fire. And we found holding Jeff Bezos and Amazon's feet to the fire is very difficult, it turns out. It didn't work. The EU is trying to do it. It's not working. <laughs> It's hard. They're we just big. simply don't have enough money to do that. Yeah, they're big. But Brett, we want to help you where we can, man. Get 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 us exactly what you're looking for and see if we can source it. Um, Janice has given a shout out to Ty. Um, just talking about how great he's been and how awesome and patient. So thank we you, agree. Janice. Yes, we, we agree. agree. He actually has a baby coming at the end of the month. So oh my goodness. Came in soon. Um, Phyllis is asking if she can choose to have a heat pump instead of electric AC heat. Phyllis, I have great news for you. You're getting a heat pump instead of electric AC heat. That's what we do. There stand. you go. Um, no. All our homes include a, a heat pump as opposed to strip heat uh, or uh, the, the the type that you're talking about. You're going to get a heat pump no matter what. It's technically heat pumps are electric, um, but they work a little bit different than an old conventional electric heater. Or uh, so yeah, you, we do a heat pump standard in all of our homes. Great. Um, Laura is asking if window screens are included in the price of the home. Great question. The answer is yes. And yeah. Laura, I'm going to just give you kudos for not for noticing that the models don't have them. Is why you asked that question because you're so uh, introspective and uh, very just very very sharp. So we don't have one of the models because they look prettier and cleaner uh, right. in pictures and from the highway uh, when they don't have screens. But yes, um, we the screens will be in the attic uh, basically when the when the um, when all the windows get delivered. We don't put them on there during construction for the same reasons that Don alluded to earlier. Um, there are gremlins that live on job sites and they eat delicate things like screens. They um, are destroyed. So uh, they'll be stored usually up in the attic or maybe they come way after the fact. And, uh, but yes, your home will have half screens. So the parts that's operable of the windows, those parts will have screens installed before you close. Awesome. 
let's see. Um, he's is saying that there are programs that require you do not currently own a home in order to qualify. So you may not be first time. However, you cannot own a home at the time. True. Okay. So our, our statement on first time homeowners. That's right. Yeah. That's a very good point. Ms. Davis. I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, yeah. There's a lot of ones that you can't own two homes at one time. Um, and that's true for, for whether you have, you know, your first home or your 12th home. You're exactly right. Uh, and in any of those cases, you would have to be able to qualify for both mortgages anyway. So, um, yeah, great point. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Rob is asking, they own their current home outright with no lien. Um, the value of the current home is more than what they plan to build with us. Would they be able to use the current home and the property they own um, as collateral for the build? So, Rob, that's a, that's a great, great question. Um, we're, not, we're probably not going to collateralize your existing home. Um, though you could probably, we've seen people take a home equity loan against it and take that money and put it towards the house. Or I, what I don't know is if you plan on selling that home. So my, I'm assuming that you want to maybe live in that while the Tilson home is being built and then use those funds to pay for the home upon completion. There's a couple of ways to do that. One would be go ahead and get approved up front for the uh, full amount. Use our money. Uh, interest-free for the duration of construction, put your home on the market, you know, 60 to 90 days prior to, to closing. And you can switch the home from a, like the, the, the deal with us from a loan to a cash deal at closing. Like it's whether we're being funded by XYZ mortgage or Rob billing at completion is, is irrelevant. You know, it's just who the funds are coming from. Uh, is, is who's going to get the release of lien, so to speak. So you would just get a release of lien in that case on our build and, and be done with it. But that's, I'd say you use our money for free. Um, go and get a loan, you know, as if you're going to get a loan from a mortgage company, get approved for it. If something does happen, you decide you don't want to sell that existing home, you want to rent it out, something like that, you can do that and still have the, the mortgage. Um, you have some options. I, I like having options. Options are good. Options are good. Yeah, great question. But All right. See, um, Lupe has a question about one of our plans, the outer dimensions of the Goliad. Um, cool. We can uh, give that real quick if you want to move on to the to another right. question. I mean, I don't know which which elevation. I'll just pull one up. Um, but you're basically looking at uh, 36 feet wide and about 43 feet deep, thereabouts. All right. Very good. Um, Edgar is saying that his sales consultant recently said that there was going to be a price increase. Has that actually taken place? Um, yes, it has. Uh, we do adjust our prices quarterly. So the first Monday of the quarter um, is when we kind of write, write up our prices based on any changes that have happened in the market. So that price increase that she would have been talking about has already happened. So what you're seeing on our website right now are the, the most recent prices. Yeah, yeah, those are current. And so we're probably looking, uh, you know, the end of, end of the next quarter is um, in August like that. I do know that lumber pricing is going up again. Um, you got to follow that on, on the internet. You can get lumber future prices, but lumber has gone up tremendously because demand has gone up. Um, builders aren't really slowing down at all. So lumber demand is, is at full peak right now. In fact, it's back to its record high levels, which were from June or July of 2018 were the record lumber oh, wow. prices, and we're, we're back. They're back. Yeah. All right. Um, Luann is, is kind of given a, given a, you know, representation of how much we'll let somebody change something. Um, they, we changed the entire plan inside the San Antonio. So she worked with Patricia and Angleton and just completely redrew the whole thing. So. That's oh yeah. The one that I'm thinking about, they made the side, the front and yeah, yeah. It's, oh. it's completely different. Than, we shared uh, one of those last week where we made the we back and front and yeah, we yes. can, we can do whatever. So very cool. Thanks for sharing. Luann. I appreciate that. Thanks Luann. Um, Crystal and Derek are asking when finishing the out, finishing out the inside of the home, does it include ceiling fans or is this something done after closing also? Um, so we are going to include a ceiling fan in your living room as well as all of your bedrooms. Um, you also have the option if there was any other room that you wanted to add it to, we could we could do that prior to closing. So that that's gonna gonna be that way when you move in. That's right. And I will a little little tip of advice if you want to um, provide your own fans and you don't want us to do it, make sure that we actually install the lighting block to support the fan because I've, I have a lot of friends who didn't do that and their fan fell down because it wasn't wasn't supported. Not in a Tilson home. 
not in a Tilson home. I'm just saying like in, in other places, everybody's like, oh, there's a light. I'll just put a fan out. That's no big deal. It's a big deal. Like, yeah, you can you always have, tell when you go into right. a room, if there's two switches on the wall, even if there's just a light up there, if there's two switches, there should be one for the fan motor mm -hmm. and one for the light. Um, so if it's not blocked and wired, like, like Donna's saying, yeah, you don't want to just throw a ceiling fan up anywhere you see just a single switch. You'll want to have, be sure you have uh, two switches on the wall. If you see two switches on the wall and just a little dome light fixture, chances are pretty good that, that it's blocked and wired for a ceiling fan. We block and wire, like she said, all of our bedrooms and living room is going to be done that way. Um, and then, you know, there, there's a nominal fee if you want to block and wire there. Ceiling uh, porches is, a, is an area where people will add, uh, mm -hmm. will block and wire out there. But yeah, don't be just hanging a ceiling fan from a light fixture. Um, yeah, don't do not do it. Yeah. Don't. Or if you do, don't sleep under it. Do <laughs> don't stand under it while it's going. Yeah. Um, not a good plan. Um, let's see. Angelica is asking the approximate base price difference in the San Jacinto B and D. Um, you can actually check that out on our website, uh, specifically for your county. Um, on on that page, you can you can pull down and and see. Um, it'll show you the full range of prices. So you can see it. Um, let's see. Can new build be connected to existing sewer, water, and carport, or do we need those to be new also? Great question. So sewer and water, most likely. Uh, that's going to be actually up to the, typically that's a city. I don't know if you're building inside of a city or out in the county. If you're talking about existing septic and water well, the answer is almost certainly yes. Yeah. Definitely yes on the water well. Um, it is a 85% yes on the septic system. What we want to look at is uh, a lot of cases people are moving out of a mobile home, let's say, into an existing home, uh, to a new build, a custom home. The the mobile homes are higher, you know, they're up on, they're up in the air. Mm. Uh, so they have typically more fall going to the septic system may not be buried as deep. That's what I'm saying. So uh, we want to look at that, but we shoot those grades at the uh, stakeout meeting and we'll know for sure. But most cases we're able to use the existing septic system makes it water well. It is up to the County. Uh, they have to bless it. They have to say, yes, this home, you know, if you were living in a one bedroom, you know, RV trailer, that's what the septic was designed for. They probably are going to not let you do a four bedroom home to the same sewer system, but mostly that's not, probably the case. not a good idea. And the carport, uh, we're probably not going to, we're not going to connect the carport. We're not going to join uh, those structures together because we do have a, we have to provide a structural warranty by law on the slab, the frame and the roof. So we're not going to be able to join them. Um, however, that uh, we can either build a new one or you can um, connect them in a different way. But unfortunately, we're not going to be able to connect, tie into existing structures that are on the land. Okay. That makes sense. Um, Brett is saying thank you for answering his question. Um, they have they are under contract and waiting for stakeout. They're doing a Preston Fredericksburg hybrid. So again, okay. we took two of our plans okay. and put them yep. together, um, working with Darla and Weatherford. So thank you so much. Awesome, thanks, Brett. We appreciate it. Um, let's see. Melanie is asking about our cabinet options. Um, do we offer cabinets that go to the ceiling? She doesn't like having a shelf above the cabinets because it just collects it's dust. Just, well, you're right, yeah, Melanie. You're right. <laughs> You know, but yeah, the answer is yes, we can go up to the ceiling um, with the cabinets. We actually, sometimes the cabinets can be that tall. Um, they start to get over 42 or 48 inches. They start to become, um, well, just dangerously large to install and to hang up there for a long time. So um, what we'll sometimes do is mount cabinets even above those. You can actually go look at like our, um, like the Wimberley interior pictures. You can see cabinets above cabinets. Um, that's one way to do it. And another way to do it is to actually, you can fur the ceiling down or fur the wall down where it comes down flush with the front of the cabinets. The, uh, um, San Jacinto is done that way. If you go look at the wall of the San Jacinto where the, uh, like, um, the pantry is and where the refrigerator space would go, you'll see where the, uh, we actually fur down where the cabinets are. It looks like they're built into the wall, like furniture. So that's another way to, to skin that cat, Melanie. Great question. Thanks for asking. All right. Great. Let's see. Mando is asking. By the way, it's a big deal. It's easier on your AC unit if you will dust properly. So clearly, yeah. Melanie does. Yes. Um, Mando is asking, how does financing typically work? Um, so it, yeah, basically, we can just we can just explain to him how this happens. All right. Um, so so Mendo. So okay. yes, we are not typical. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not typical. But I'm glad you asked. And it does look like you have some pretty serious familiarity with, with mortgage lending. 
because technically speaking, it does work just like a refinance. Um, the difference simply being you're refinancing an interest-free loan from Tilson. Uh, but so the way it works is you it would work exactly how you would be go if you're going and buying an existing home in a subdivision, like through a realtor or a resale, uh, or if you're buying an existing home in a subdivision from a production builder, let's say. So uh, you go get approved for the permanent loan for that for that amount. Let's say it's three hundred thousand dollars. So uh, let's say it's going to cost you three hundred thousand dollars to build this home with Tilson. You're simply going to go get approved upfront with a permanent lender for the $300,000. So fully underwritten, they'll do the last two years of bank state, last two years of W-2s, last two years of um, bank statements, all that, you know, all case statements, all that kind of good stuff, fully underwritten. And they'll do an appraisal upfront based on the plans and specs that we supply to them. And then uh, once we get that permanent takeout letter or, or permanent mortgage uh, approval in our hands for you, we build that house from zero to completely finished out of our own back pocket and you don't close on it till the house is done. There's no payments accruing. There's no interest accruing. You're not making any payments. Um, there's not a draw schedule that the bank has to come out and inspect and then sign off on payments and you dual party checks and all that garbage. Um, Tilson builds the whole house and you don't close until you've done your walkthrough, finish the homeowner orientation. We've completed the punch out list and you're a happy camper. Then you go to the mortgage company and then you close. Whereas with most other custom builders, all other custom builders in Texas, they they do a construction loan or construction to permanent like you're looking at. So you close on that up front. They're going to make it sound real good um, that you lock in a low, low interest rate. Well, newsflash, all rates are low right now. So they're not doing you any favors. They'll use uh, language like no payments for 12 months. That's right. Yeah, they'll say no payments for 12 months. The interest is accruing, by the way, like a taxi meter or your Uber yes. ride. Um, and yeah, you, you have to close on that construction loan and that's, that is designed to be a short term loan, usually 12 to 18 months. Uh, so it's higher interest, right? Cause it is typically interest only payments. So, um, and you start making payments traditionally immediately, as soon as you close on that loan. Uh, and even if you're not making payments, then those payments are accruing and you'll make them at closing. It'll be part of your closing cost. It'll be double, in fact, the amount of your ordinary closing cost because all that interest is rolled forward into that uh, permanent loan. So um, great, great question. But yeah, we we basically, we do a promissory, you're going to sign a promissory note and a uh, builder's and mechanics lien contract. And with, with Tilson, we get you approved up front for the permanent loan. And then upon completion, we assign that note and lien to whoever's provides the permanent mortgage. And by the way, a construction loan works very, very similar. The builder probably won't have a lien on the property, but the bank will. So right. it's the exact same thing. The bank's going to have a lien on your property while the home is being built on that construction loan part. And then upon completion, that bank is going to convert that into a permanent loan to who, whatever lender makes them whole. Um, the difference is you have Tilson's skin in the game all the way through to closing and completion and beyond. Whereas with another builder, they're getting paid along the way. Um, so they've only got about maybe three to 5% um, at stake at the very, very end there. So sometimes stuff doesn't get finished because mm -hmm. uh, it ain't worth it to them. So anyway, very, very great question. Thank you for asking. Yes. Hope that, hope that clears it up. And we actually had a related question um, that someone had asked, because you mentioned we, we do an upfront appraisal. Um, so we know exactly what your home's going to be worth as it's right. built. Um, so we had a question about who's paying for that upfront appraisal and also what happens if that appraisal comes back lower um, than we were expecting. All right. Great question, Dawn. Thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> so uh, the appraisal up front is, is typically in your, whatever mortgage lender that you end up using, um, whether it's one of our preferred lenders or anybody end up picking, they're going to have what's called an application fee, uh, ranges between $600 and $1,000. Um, that is to pay for the appraisal. Um, that's part, part of that application fee is the appraisal they're gonna, So they're going to pay for an appraiser. Uh, Tilson doesn't pick the appraiser. You as the landowner don't pick the appraiser. The bank is going to order the appraisal. So that's a, that's a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac deal. Mm -hmm. So they order the appraisal. That's how it, that's how that's paid for. And then if the appraisal comes back low, it would depend on what you mean by low. So all Tilson requires again is that 10% equity position. So as long as it comes back and the 10% equity is covered, you know, that's, there's nothing to do uh, with it. If it does come back and you're not at that 10% level, then we're going to have a conversation about, okay, well, you can either make up the difference in, in a, in a cash down payment uh, to us. If you have a balance on the land, you can pay that land balance down. Um, or we, in some cases we've taken what's referred to as an equity deposit. So 
uh, we take simply a deposit, which is different a down payment in that you would get it back at, at closing if you if you okay. didn't, uh, put that money down on the house, let's say. So, but most people just end up putting money down on the house to get to that ten percent requirement and, and move on down the road. Okay, great. And then we had another one. I think we sort of addressed it, but just want to make sure that we we got it covered. Um, do I have to sell my current house before building? Yeah, the answer is it depends on your approval. So uh, if you can if you if, if you can qualify for both mortgages, then then no. Like if you have the income, the debt to income ratios to support qualifying for both mortgages, then no, you don't have to sell it. Um, if you do not, and they're going to ask that you do sell the, the existing home, then then yes, uh, you'll you'll definitely have to have that home sold or at least under contract, uh, most likely before building. Now we are, you know, there are sm certain situations where we can look at what kind of equity position you have in that existing home. Mm -hmm. You know, we can do a CMA. We have real estate agent on on staff that can do a, a competitive market analysis and see how long it's taking for homes to sell in your area and look at different things. But but generally speaking, that house will will need to be sold. Um, prior to that. Now we've seen customers that'll sell it, then lease it back and live in it. Um, so that uh, while it's, so you don't have to move twice. So there's all kinds of options out there. Don't, don't let that be an obstacle. We can help walk you through that. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, Lauren is asking, can we add the San Jacinto D kitchen to other plans like the Livingston? Um, and if yes, ballpark, how much does that cost? So I can say yes, we absolutely can because we do it all the time. Um, it's one of our most popular kitchens, so we get a lot of requests to put that in other plans. We do, yeah. You're looking at, I mean, it, it's it's going to be somewhere depending on what all features of the Santa Cena kitchen you like. Right? Like, it's not going to fit exactly. You know, you, you can't just cut it out and pop it in there. Uh, you got and you're going to lose some cabinetry. That believe it or not, that brick or the stone that goes over there with the cedar above it that takes up a significant amount of space in that kitchen. So you may lose a little bit of countertop area on the cooktop bar, but you know, depending on what all features of the San Jacinto you put in there, it could be somewhere between, you know, five and eight thousand um, dollars worth of additional cabinetry work, stone work, that kind of thing. Depending on if you want all the features of it, if you just want the island, it may not be quite uh, quite as much. But if you want everything that you see, you know, the island, the curved bar top, the stone behind, um, yeah, we can with a design consultant and get that price out exactly for you, Lauren. So thanks for asking. Great. Let's see. Uh, Melissa has some inside information from Darla um, that we have new cabinets and colors coming. Um, she's curious when that is. Yeah, so um, it is in process. So uh, there, there's some samples going out uh, soon. Uh, in fact, some some offices may have received them, but that's probably uh, officially going to be more of an August uh, mm -hmm. deal than than a July deal. Was it was today July twenty yeah. second? Yeah, probably not. Yeah, like a week and a half. Yeah, yeah, definitely an August thing. Yes. Let's see. Jason is asking, he owns his own land and wants to have a Tilson home built on it. Um, you'd need a new septic system and new water water well. Um, can we include that in the house total? Um, and then he's also asking, do we use the land as collateral in lieu of a down payment? Jason, that is exactly what we do. Yes. Um, the, the land is collateralized in lieu of a down payment, so you don't have to have cash down. The equity you have in your property counts. Mm -hmm. And yes, so long as the appraisal will support a new septic system, new water well, we will include that in the house total. Yep. And you don't have to come up with that out of pocket. So great, great question. All right. Um, Lupe is asking if there are packages for the interior, such as lighting upgrades, appliances, and finishes. And yes, absolutely. 100%. Um, all of our design centers have that, that color room um, area where they can show you um, all of those features. And we do have packages that are, that are put together for you. So they can show you those options when you go out to tour the model. They can show you some of the stuff that we have. Yeah. And we typically have different packages in the different model homes. So you know, we may have a, our included package in one model and then one of the upgraded packages in the other model home. And even that's not the limit. Like, like she said, the design center, there'll be more packages shown. All right. Let's see. Megan says she was looking through our Facebook and saw a beautiful home um, that was stone and blue um, that we had said was the Colorado. Um, the closest home in our current, current uh, portfolio is the Angelina. And she's asking about what the differences between the two are. Um, not much. Yeah. One sells really well, one didn't. That's the biggest difference between, <laughs> the, between the two. Yeah, Megan, it was very, very few. Uh, we, we sold very few Colorados and we sold very few of them without being changed pretty significantly. So mm -hmm. the, um, the Angelina was kind of what we took, we, you know, we, as plans are not performing and Don can speak more to this, like we're, they have a, we have a whole team, right? Yes. Very large team. 
um, <laughs> that looks through it all. So really what we're doing um, in that group, when we're redesigning a plan, we're considering, you know, what are the most common changes that uh, customers are asking for in our plans? Because some of some of the plans were very old, like they've been around for a while. Um, so just kind of modernizing the layouts. Um, we did a lot of changes to ceiling heights um, and changing out the kitchens to something that's just a little bit more more modern and, and gives you more space to work in. Um, so it's really there's not a lot. They're about the same square footage. It's going to have the same number of bedrooms and bathrooms. It's just a, a few little tweaks. Um, the only major change that I would say between the Angelina and the Colorado is that we no longer have that Mediterranean um, style elevation because it really wasn't wasn't selling well for us and just couldn't couldn't justify the cost of what it was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it the two plans are very similar. Cool. Great question. Thanks, Megan. Great question. Um, let's see. Melanie is saying she wishes that builders would start putting the woman's dressing space outside of the bathroom. If I agree. Know. That's something we talk about um, in our portfolios. If it's very when we're in our meetings, there's very we're divided on that. The other thing that we we debate strongly is where should the utility and laundry room be. Um, but if if you don't like where where your where your closet is or your dressing space, just tell your design consultant. We can move that around for you. Is it a humidity thing? Like, what's the? Don, help me out. Um, My yeah. hair doesn't get messed up when I'm getting dressed. <laughs> in this. I don't. I can't relate. I don't know. It's it's just a personal preference. Some of it's humidity. You know, if, if you've got somebody else getting ready, you know, you've got the the shower going, and you've got the humidity, and what is it doing to your clothes? And just it's it's it can be uncomfortable. How long does the process take for one to get dressed? I'm curious. It, it depends, like how many outfits you got to do. You know, got it. just you, you just gotta you know you never know. It varies. Tilson uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> out four minutes getting ready and everybody's like and it shows <laughs> well it, the, the hair helps like lack, lack thereof. yes thank you melanie for us good feedback yes, and um, good feedback on will gladly march that feedback right back into the portfolio review meeting next time we will i just got that the next one just got scheduled this morning so i will make a note of that um, Angelica is actually was asking us about the San Jacinto. So the two elevations that you actually mentioned were the lowest price and the highest price. So that's what the range is yep. um, that you're seeing there. Um, so one's, so. The D, one's the D, if, I, if that's what she was asking. Yes. Let's see. Um, Mark is asking something about permanent lending. Um, does the lender require you to put all of your acreage up as collateral? Um, they're thinking about giving an acre to you to his son and his wife. Um, so would they need to do that before they apply for the permanent loan? So Mark, that's a great question. And uh, the answer is no, you don't necessarily have to put all of it up uh, as collateral. So um, in fact, we rarely see people do, if they have a large acreage, you know, if you've got 20 acres or more, something like that, even 15 or more, um, we often see the customers will survey out. Um, definitely have in mind where you're thinking that's going to be. Uh, the part that you're going to give to your to the son and his wife. And by the way, if, the, if you're going to surprise them with that one day, hopefully they don't watch this. Um, or maybe you have two sons and you're talking about one, not the other. I, I and then that. they'll just know which the favorite is. That's right. Just don't tell them. Don't tell them until later. <laughs> um, but but uh, what the only thing I would caution is, and it's pretty rare in rural areas, but it is still possible, is that the county could require it to be replatted. So um, let us know what county it is, or, or and, and maybe maybe we may know right offhand. Or um, if you want to reach out to your um, to the county and ask them, hey, I've got 15 acres like this. I'm going to carve out this too for my my son and his wife. Are you going to require me to replant that? And they'll usually tell you around the spot. Most of them are going to say no. Do, do whatever you want to do. Um, but yeah, you wouldn't want to collateralize that and then try and cut it out later. It's not impossible. Um, it can still be cut out later from the lender. Even they've they've got a process what's what's called a partial release of lien, where they can if they have a lien on all 15 acres, let's say that's collateralized, you can say, well, hey, look, I've got you know 27% equity into this thing. Let's say you've paid on it for seven, 10, 12 years. Th that's enough equity for you to carve out these two acres that I can give them to my son and his wife. So we've seen that happen as well. Is great, that the great. same thing as, as what we see when somebody already has a mobile home on the property with a loan? Is that how they're getting that? Sometimes, yeah, that is what, yeah, that is exactly, yeah, that's true. That's one way they can get that. They can either survey that out um, if the appraisal will support. And again, a lot of this comes down to the appraisal because obviously every amount of acres that you take away from the land is going to reduce it in value. Mm -hmm. right? If you had 15 acres, but you're only putting up 13, okay, well, 
13 is worth less than 15 is. So it will affect the appraisal some, but probably not enough uh, in a large, large acreage situation to make that big of a difference. On a mobile home, um, same thing. You may carve that out and leave that out for, you know, me, mom, papa, or rent it out to somebody. Um, but then a lot of times you have to get a certificate of detachment from the state of Texas on a mobile home. Totally different situation, not okay. related to Mark's situation, but um, don't want to be quiet. Got it. No, nah, <laughs> no, it's a real thing. A lot of our customers have to have to deal with it, so it may come up. Awesome. Well, we did have a couple more questions that people had submitted in advance, so I want to make sure that we get sure. through those. Um, one was, "What is our best advice for what they should look for when they're buying property? Like, what should we avoid?" I would avoid floodplains. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big one to avoid. Um, it's easy information to find out. You can find it out real quick um, for very inexpensive, in fact, $0 uh, on the FEMA's website. So I would avoid that. I would avoid, um, I would personally avoid a city, but that's that's a personal preference thing. Yeah. Um, and I would avoid, if I could, major thoroughfares that could be open to like widening and changing. Um, so large state highways, state thoroughfares that aren't already widened. I mean, most people don't want to live on those anyway, but it's just something to consider if, if TxDOT at one point wants to widen a highway and take part of your property. Eric, it's almost like you've seen that happen. Yeah, or you lived it. Hard as Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's the thing to think about. And then um, open title on everything. Uh, any piece of property you're looking mm -hmm. at, Open title. It costs zero dollars to open title to take the legal description of what you're looking at, take it to a title company, and say, "I would like a title commitment on this." It doesn't cost title insurance costs money. Title commitment costs nothing. The only difference between the two is a title commitment is them telling you, "Hey, if you take care of these things, we will give you title insurance on this piece of property for X amount of dollars." Um, and that will tell you if there's any kind of weird, wild things you can't see. I always tell people, I'm never, ever, ever worried about things on land that I can see. I'm always worried about things on piece of property I can't see, right? What's the soil like underneath? Is there a pipeline running through there somewhere that I don't know about? And is it clearly indicated on the surface of the property? Is there a blanket easement that someone can come and, and drill for oil anywhere on the property? Mm -hmm. uh, are there aerial easements from the power company that there's not a power line there right now, but there could be at a later date? Um, so easements, uh, liens, tax liens, did, did someone who owned it before, you know, did they, uh, own their own private practice doing psychology or podiatry or something, and they didn't pay payroll taxes for six years and the IRS slapped a federal tax lien on it. Like you're not going to be able to see that on the property that's going to show up in a title report. So open title, it costs nothing. Mm -hmm. And, um, floodplain stuff costs nothing. Those are two that, that but other than that, Man, let's go look at it. Let's check it out. Let's yeah, I, I would also add if it is within a development, um, get the architectural guidelines and read them. Mm. Um, I know it's it's going to be a document, yay thick, but read them and and know what you're in for. Make sure that you yeah. can decide what color your front door is painted and know that it has to be X number of square feet and has to be certain percentage masonry, um, those kinds of things. Make sure that you know what, what you're in for. Yes. And if keeping a 68 Nova in the front yard on blocks is important to you, you need to know up front. That you can't do that. Not, that you can't yes. do that. So yeah. that you have to build it its own garage. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's a great, great point. Any kind of deed restrictions, covenants, uh, mm -hmm. covenants, setbacks. Yep. Um, and those are all public uh, information. So mm -hmm. that, that, that information is recorded at, at the county courthouse. We can pull it up typically online in the, in the sales office for you. And yeah. We'll good Google search. Will and if you, can't you go to, if you can't go to sleep tonight, bust that bad boy out, start reading through it. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> About 11 minutes. Yeah. That will do it. Um, somebody else asked where the septic system is usually installed um, relative to the placement of the home. Um, and they were mainly interested in it if that affected where they can put a pool. It can. Yeah. So um, typically the septic system is not too far from the house. It's typically off to one side or in the back. That's the tanks themselves. And it, these days it's usually one block of, of concrete that has partitions inside it or chambers. Um, they're, they're usually about the size of a, of a, of a small car. Uh, so it's like you're burying a, a small car on your property. So you got enough room to do that. And, um, and they're typically within 10 or 15 feet of the home. But then the 
the either the field lines that run from them, if it's conventional, or the, the uh, sprinkler lines that run from them, the, those are further away from the house, usually uh, 50 or so feet from the home. And they have they can't spray within 10 feet of the property line. Obviously, we wouldn't if you're planning on doing a pool later, and we kind of walk you through this at the stakeout appointment, you know, we're probably gonna avoid putting either the septic system or any of the sprinkler heads like right behind the house where you would walk off the porch and, and be in the spray field. Nothing harmful about it, but if you want to do any kind of outdoor living later, whether it's uh, pavers or a pool or something like that, you're going to have to go dig those lines up, move them somewhere else. It's going to be a headache. So, um, yeah, to the side. Now, what we see a lot is they'll do the septic system to the side or the rear, and then the spray heads are actually at the front, spraying the front yard a little bit or the side yard. So that, you know, it's pretty useful. Okay. Great question. Great question, right. Don. Thanks for asking. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, let's see. Tamara is asking, um, how do we handle VA loans and mortgages? Do we still require a 10% down? So yeah, we actually do Tamara. So, uh, because Tilson's doing the no construction loan, um, and, but, but when we say 10% down, it's in, you already own the land or you at least have money into the land. So you're actually not putting the money down with us. You're not cutting us a check of a down payment. The equity you have in your property is your down payment. So, so, you know, you're not going to be going, if the house is $300,000 and your land that you already own is worth 50, you're still only asking for a $300,000 loan. You're not getting a $350,000 because you own right. the land. So, I mean, you're not putting, you're still not putting anything down. It's an equity requirement that, that you're going to meet. So great yeah. question. Hope that helps clear it up, but uh, you're not necessarily putting anything down with Tilson the 10% is an equity requirement that you have into the land. You don't have to necessarily put, most of our customers don't have to put anything down uh, when they build with us, VA, FHA, conventional or otherwise. So. Right. When well, we also do tell people who are interested in VA to also check out the text that program. Um, some of some of our customers find that that's actually better for them because since you have um, that equity already, you know, the benefit of VA is that there there is no down payment, no equity requirement typically. Um, usually if you already have that equity, um, it, it's better off to go with another program because VA does have some higher fees um, associated yeah. for that privilege. Yeah. In TexVet, you get all the same benefits that you would, all the same entitlements that you would from VA. Uh, you have to be a Texas resident for the last three years to qualify for TexVet. Okay. And then Ephraim is asking if our design centers are open on Saturdays and are they by appointment? Um, yes, all our design centers are open. We are requesting um, that you do make an appointment um, just because of this phase that we're in with COVID, we like to know how many people are, are planning to be there at once so we can make sure that we can let everybody in and have proper social distancing. Yeah. So yeah, they're there from 10 to six. Um, we're also open on Sundays from, from 12 to six as well. All right, let's see. Um, Mark, who was asking us before, he says his, his acreage is in Grimes County. I was way off, I said 15. <laughs> Price is right rule. He looked like the kind of guy that had about 15 acres. That's what he looked You're like. You're close. I was close. Cool, Mark. Yeah, we hope we can help you. So do, does would he need to replot? I think that was the question. Oh, um, uh, Grimes County? I doubt it. <laughs> no, you're going to be pretty good to go in Grimes County. I'll be glad to put a call into uh, the folks in Anderson, Texas and ask, but I'm, 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 I'm pretty confident that you're going to be good to go in Grimes County. All right. Excellent. Um, let's see. Ruben is saying that his land tax value is ten thousand on last year's tax record, but the land around him is selling for fifty thousand to seventy thousand. Um, how would we get an accurate value on it when we build? Don, this is much like the SAT question. You got one train that leaves Chicago. At the <laughs> Another one leaves. No, Ruben, that's a great, great question. Yes. So um, the good news about appraisals is they are based on comps or comparable sales recently in the area. Uh, so if those if those lots have in fact sold for the fifty to seventy thousand dollar range, and they are in the MLS, they can be documented that they were mm -hmm. sold at that price. Um, that's going to be a really really critical part. But if if those if both those things are true, then that's going to be the appraised value. It's going to come back close to that fifty to seventy. Totally cool with having the land value low, right? Saves you money on your tax bill here right. in Texas, and they can get out of rack, out of rack out of whack in a hurry. Um, that uh, but but. Yeah, if, if, if that's what they're selling for and there's comps there to support it and there's documentation to support the 50 to 70,000, that's what the appraisal will appraiser will collect. And that's that's going to be closer to what it appraises at. So, yeah, the tax value, it's a really good question because the tax mm -hmm. value that's on the tax rolls is very rarely the same value that, that the, the true market value. Right. There's places where it's pretty close 
Um, but there's other places where it's it's not they haven't reassessed it in a long, long time and shh, keep it that way. Yeah. It's totally fine. We're you okay with them being slow. Um, Tamara is asking, do we put in many gray water systems? We do. Uh, not not a whole ton, but we put it, I don't know what mini is. Um, and there's mini, not mini, but um, we put in a few. Yeah. Uh, so gray water for, for folks that are that aren't familiar with that on the septic system, um, things like your washing machine, um, maybe bathroom sinks, that kind of stuff. Um, anywhere there aren't traditionally bodily fluids going, that can go into a gray water system um, so that you don't over flood the uh, a, a septic system. We do find it being less and less on a convent. I'm sorry, on an aerobic system. They can handle a little more because they're spraying the water out. But if you're on a conventional system and the soil was kind of marginal, being able to handle that many gallons per minute or gallons per day, a gray water system was a good way to kind of run that to a separate stub. Um, and your washing machine water and your uh, sink water, with the exception of your kitchen sink, um, would go out to that gray water. And then just your showers and your commodes. Uh, would be on with black water or the sewer water going to the actual septic system. Okay. Didn't get me yet. Didn't get you yet. Well, then I've got I've got this one. What are our options for handling tornadoes? Yeah, tornadoes are optional. Thank you, Dick. For asking. <laughs> you don't recommend them. They're not standard. They're not included. Um, yeah, so we we actually recommend a company called Family Safe. Um, we have no partnership with them, no affiliation with them whatsoever. Uh, we have seen their product. We've seen their product used in many of our customers' homes. I've seen our product installed, uh, their product installed in our homes, and I believe it to be a very good product. Um, luckily, I, I don't know of any that has performed in our homes. Um, it's almost like like when you wash your car and it's going to rain. Seemingly, when you put a tornado shelter in, you don't ever get a tornado. So cheap insurance, but um, yeah, I recommend. Well. I, what I don't recommend is you is you try to build some kind of a makeshift engineered room, okay, out of like cinder blocks or engineered wood. Or like if you want to do, if you're really serious about wanting tornado options, buy something that is designed and rated and tested for tornadoes, um, and that's family safe. And there are rating companies out there, rating institutions out there, um, just like the National Transportation Highway Safety Board, like. There's true, legit, and not just trying to say, well, let's make thicker walls and concrete this and rebar that. Like, no, get a proper tornado shelter. Good advice. Um, Christy is asking, will the water well be dug to depth requested by the customer or just till they hit water? Uh, okay, to the Trinity, the Trinity River, not the Holy Trinity, the Trinity <laughs> River. Um, so, that. <laughs> so the, uh, the answer is, if you have a specific depth that you want to dug to, you'll do it. There is such a thing as going through an aquifer, though. So that's something to be, I would certainly be open to what the water well driller is saying. They're typically pretty experienced in that area. They have records. Uh, they're required to record everything, all the depths they go to with TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. The TCEQ wants to know where water wells are because they use that in stormwater planning, in wastewater planning. Um, so it, they know about how far they're going to end up having to go. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly there's a, a price per lineal foot for going down. So usually there's a price that'll, you know, they may give you a, a blanket price and that's good to 250 or 300 feet of depth. And then anything beyond that is $20, foot, $20 per foot that we have to go down further. Um, but, but in other words, it's kind of like one of those things, just cause you should do, just cause you can do something doesn't mean you should. So for instance, well, if uh, good water's at, at 350 feet, I want you to go to 700 feet. Like, well, you could actually go through a really, really good aquifer and into a worse aquifer at 700 feet. That's possible. So I would certainly be open-minded to, to at least listening to the feedback of the uh, water well driller. But yes, if there's a specific depth that you know you want to go to because you've got a well next door that you've been on for 50 years and it's never run dry, I'm sure they'd be open to doing that. Okay, great. And then one last question. Um, do kitchen sinks come with the disposal? Yes, um, so they do, and uh, but you should not put everything down a sink that, go, that can go through a disposal if you're living on a septic. Um, I would be very careful about putting food product down there. So do the best you can when, when, when your kids, you know, obviously they're going to finish the broccoli and asparagus, but they're going to leave the roll and cornbread on the plate and the honey. So rake the, the roll and the cornbread into the trash can and then rinse them off. You know, a little bit of food products not going to not going to hurt anything too bad, Kathy, but but definitely don't want to be 
you know, just taking the whole plate, raking off the disposal, I'll turn it on and go. So really disposals on there just to kind of, if the, if there's been some material in the sink and it just won't drain quite right, hit that thing on real quick, get it draining and then turn it back off. But yeah, don't, you don't want to get in the habit of putting a bunch of food particles down. It, it does, it, it will take its toll on a uh, conventional or aerobic septic system. Great question. All right. We actually did have one person sneak in with another question, if you don't mind. Uh, when building your back covered porch, how is the concrete flooring left after the build? Um, is there options to improve the look if it's just if it's left just floated? So what we do is we actually um, typically give it a broom finish of some sort. It's a little bit different type of finish than um, the, the house or even the garage. Um, but it's it's it is. Uh, they put the same machines on as they do everywhere else, but yeah, there are there are other options if you want to to do a, a different type of look. I guess you could stain it just like stain concrete, or um, mm -hmm. I've seen people do brick. I've seen people do tile, um, but it's typically just concrete floors, um, and it's a it's a finish. Of course, it slopes as well, so it's very very slightly. You don't really notice it actually unless you put a golf ball on it, and like, but it's to to drain water off of there. But um, it is it is still a concrete finish. It's not a uh, you know, a high polish finish or anything like that, or a, a, a score or stamp. We don't have any, have any offer any kind of stamping of that. Um, Cause of course it's, it's being done in a, what's called a monolithic pour. It's being done at the same time as the, the rest of the home. It's all part of the engineer foundation design. Okay. That makes sense. All right. And that is all that we have for today. All right. Well, Hey, thank you everyone. Thank you, yeah. yeah, this was great. I really, really enjoyed this. Hope y'all, hope y'all got a lot of information out of this. Thank you, uh, Kelsey and Nick for, uh, moderating the chat for us this time. Um, I know Don is proud of you guys and grateful and, uh, Don, thanks for putting this together and for joining me today. It's always great that, uh, we get to see and talk to you. So thank you. Thank you. And, um, folks don't ever, uh, don't ever hesitate to reach out to us on all of our various channels. Of course, the Facebook page, we're monitoring that all the time. Instagram, our YouTube channel, the website itself, all 11 locations that are open seven days a week. Uh, we're grateful for each and every one of you, and we hope to someday soon make you part of the Tilson family. Have a great day, guys. Bye, everybody.